Okay, this lecture will cover meiosis as well as what happens when we don't perform meiosis correctly or you have any type of chromosome abnormalities. Um, so what is meiosis? Number one, it is not mitosis. It looks very similar, but it's different. And this is a process in which haploid cells are produced from cells that are diploid. Um, once this occurs, we're going to make special cells called gametes. So let me backtrack and tell you a little bit about these words before I give you the official definition. So think of a pair of socks. Um, so let's say you have a pair of socks, which would include two socks. Um, that would be something like diploid. So you see you have a pink pair, a purple pair, and a yellow pair. All of the cells in your body, for the most part, are diploid, meaning there are one set of chromosomes from mom and one set of chromosomes from dad that make you diploid, 2N, okay? So that is a diploid cell. However, when you have sperm cells or egg cells, you need to split this number in half. So going back to our socks, this is one pink sock, one purple sock, one yellow sock, so that when the egg comes in contact with a sperm, it will end up forming a a baby that has both of the genes, some from mom and some from dad. So the process of meiosis is where we take our sets of genes, or our normal genes, and we split them in half to make special cells that only have half so that we can make a functional human being with the correct number of genes. So a little bit about diploid and haploid. Like I said, diploid is uh, refers to the chromosome number. This is where a cell or a nucleus will contain two sets of chromosomes. Uh, cells that are diploid, we call those somatic cells or body cells. So somatic cell is a body cell. Most of the cells in your body are going to be diploid or somatic. Um, and that's going to mean it actually has 46 chromosomes. So make sure that you have that number somewhere. A diploid cell will contain 46 chromosomes total. Um, and they're going to be in 23 pairs. So diploid, this is a human uh, karyotype, and um, it's going to contain 46 total chromosomes and 23 pairs of chromosomes. So those are diploid cells or um, somatic cells. A haploid number is where you only have a single set of chromosomes. So this is going to be your germ cells. So these cells are going to be responsible for making brand new humans um, and they're going to contain only half of the number of chromosomes. So again, a diploid cell will contain 46 chromosomes. It's a complete human. And for humans, a haploid cell will contain 23. This makes sense because when an egg and sperm meet, uh, the egg will have 23, the sperm will have 23, you will have 46 as the brand new embryo. So... Uh, sexual reproduction is really closely related to meiosis, and we'll talk about some of the benefits of uh, sexual reproduction as it relates to organism development. So asexual reproduction is basically when a single parent can split to produce a clone. Asexual just means that you do not have any other type of genetic material. It is literally the parent breaking apart to make a brand new clone. Uh, bacteria do this. Um, organisms that have very stable and stable environments do it because it's very rapid, very efficient. So something like E. coli can replicate itself in about 20 minutes. Um, it doesn't need another E. coli around. Um, this is going to be asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is different. It's going to be when those gametes, um, which are your egg or your sperm, come together to form a zygote. So a gamete is going to be one of the haploid or the 1N cells that are going to be able to come together to form a zygote. This is beneficial for us because it has a lot more genetic variation. Um, this is helpful for offspring. So as we're trying to make better and uh, bigger humans, this is going to allow us to have a wide variety of genes to pull from. And then it allows um, adaptation to changing environments. So again, if we had humans that were the same as they were in 1700, they wouldn't be able to adapt to things like, you know, the climate currently or our nutrition and all these different aspects. So having new genes introduced through sexual reproduction is going to truly benefit the growth of these organisms. 
So let's look at a cycle of a typical human life. And this is going to kind of pull in all the things we talked about with gamete, sperm, haploid, diploid, all that stuff. So gametes, which are the eggs in the sperm, are going to be haploid. And they are the only haploid cells in the body. Very important. Gametes or the eggs in the sperm are haploid, meaning they're one in. So you see that's just an in. That's just an end. This is a single sock, not a pair of socks, just a single sock. What happens? Um, during fertilization, you have an egg and you have a sperm that come together through fertilization and they form a gamete, which now has two in or is diploid. Okay. So each of these gametes contributed an in or a sock, if you're thinking that way. So that's coming from the sperm, that's coming from the egg. You got 23 here, 23 here. You make a diploid 2N46 chromosome human. So the diploid number is restored. We're going from haploid up here, but we're restoring it to diploid here. And then you make a human. Of course, as the human, the little baby grows, it is going to undergo mitosis because we just talked about mitosis is just pure cell division and all of the somatic cells, the normal body cells will receive the same diploid set of chromosomes. So once you are formed in this uh, zygote, you do not change your chromosomes. Changing chromosomes can lead to things like uh, some of the disorders that we have. If you're exposed to radiation, if they're exposed to cancer, these are things that could happen once you start changing the chromosomes. Um, so we want to make sure that we uh, keep this same exact chromosome number. And then as we have that, our cell is going to begin to duplicate and divide as we continue to go through the mitosis process where we will eventually end up being adult males or females. And then of course, uh, once you go through puberty and you start developing um, those sexual organs, you're going to undergo meiosis um, to form sperm and meiosis to continue to develop your eggs. All right, so let's talk a little bit uh, deeper about the meiosis process and how we can create those haploid cells with this really special or unique gene combination. So how we're gonna do this is I'm going to basically write out or you're gonna see listed out the steps of the meiosis process and then we'll go back and look at the picture and then kind of walk through each step one by one but this is a bird's eye view of what's happening so initially the dna in a normal diploid 2n cell is going to duplicate so now that duplicated diploid cell is going to represent a 4n cell so we're going from 2 to 4 because we duplicate um, and you can see that in this picture going from interface to replicating the DNA. Now we're at 4N. Um, once it does that, it's duplicated, it's going to undergo two divisions, eventually leading to four haploid, which would, you know, you can write a 1N here, yielding four haploid nuclei. So down here, we have the four haploid nuclei. You see four haploid N cells. So we start off with a regular 2N cell. We duplicate it to make it a 4N cell. We go through two rounds of division, meiosis one, meiosis two, and we end up with four haploid cells. So each of those haploid cells contains one member of the homologous pair. So here, as we started to duplicate our cells, they're going to have one member of each of the pairs. They're going to have one pink and one blue. You see here, one pink, one blue. Each homologous pair that we have is going to be special, and we'll talk about that in depth. But the reason they're special is they undergo something called crossing over. Um, and I'll talk about what crossing over is. But crossing over is going to create a haploid cell that has a very unique combination of genes. So if you look right here real close, you could see that even our chromosomes, like for instance, this one here, it is mostly pink, but right at the end, it has a little bit of blue. If you look at this one, it's mostly blue, but at the end, it has a little bit of pink. 
This is because we have the crossing over that occurs, which I will explain in depth. So the two divisions that we have um, are going to be called meiosis one and meiosis two. So we're dividing both our nucleus and our cytoplasm in the process of meiosis one and meiosis two. Each of these phases are going to include the same exact phases we covered in mitosis, okay? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. There are some uh, specific things that kind of happen, but the concept of what occurs in each of these phases is the same. So in meiosis one, some of the big things that happen here is those partner homologous chromosomes. So uh, basically like chromosomes that are really, really similar homologous chromosomes, they will pair and then they will eventually separate into different nuclei. So with meiosis one, the first one that happens, they will pair up. You see they're pairing up. You have a red or excuse me, a pink and a blue and then a, a pink and a blue. They're going to pair up and they're going to split into different nuclei. So you see they've split into different nuclei. In meiosis two, the sister chromatids, so the sister chromatids, which I will explain soon, are how it has this X format. Each side of the X will eventually split off into a brand new cell. So you see those two long blue portions here. One is 100% blue. The other one is blue and pink. That's a sister chromatid. They will split. So there's the blue and pink one. There is the just blue one. Um, and that happens during meiosis two. Okay, so this is a big picture of kind of what I showed you before, but just another way of looking at it. And it's showing you how we naturally just have our cells, right, two in. Um, they're going to undergo cell, uh, or sorry, they're going to undergo replication in which you have a four in cell here. Um, in meiosis one, crossing over will occur, and those homologous pairs will line up. At the end of meiosis one, you will have two separate cells that are going to have those sister chromosomes there. And then as they go through meiosis two, once you're finally done, you're going to have four haploid cells that can then be able to be contributed towards forming a gamete. So the purpose of meiosis, like I talked about before, is to be able to create brand new um, lineages, right? So of course, think of your family, right? I know you probably have a, a big family or uh, maybe a small close family, but regardless, you can probably look around and see there's a lot of similarities from you know, your grandparents to your, your brothers and sisters to your parents. Everyone looks kind of similar, but there are still some differences. And that's good because there are certain traits that you might be better at than maybe your brother or sister is not so good at, or maybe they're better at and you're not so good at. But all of these things are going to contribute to creating stronger human beings. So before we start our meiosis splits, let's remind you um, what happens during interphase. So remember, at the very first part of meiosis, we have to go through interphase and the S or the synthesis phase of interphase is where our DNA replicates. So remember, we're going from a cell that is 2N, so I, I can't draw on this, but it's 2N, you're replicating it, so now it is 4N. So keep that in mind. We're going from 2N to a, now a replicated 4N. As we begin meiosis one, which is the first round of splitting for our cells, we're going to start like we do with mitosis, with prophase. Um, but in this case, always make sure you pay attention to the number behind it. It's either going to say prophase one or prophase two. So prophase one, we have these homologous pairs of sister chromatids that begin to associate with each other. So it's a set of four. This set of four is also known as a tetrad or a bivalent. So this, for instance, is a tetrad. This uh, set, this blue X and this red X, this set of four is a tetrad or a bivalent, the blue X and the red X. Um, and each of the individual sides of the X are known as sister chromatids. So imagine they're, you know, they're right next to each other. So think of them as being sisters. Um, and then the process of when you have these four um, chromatids together is just called synopsis. Um, so I just want to kind of give you that in case you see that in your reading. 
So in prophase one, very important, this is when crossing over occurs. So crossing over occurs here and it's used to create genetic variation, okay? Genetic variation. So crossing over is where we have segments of our DNA that are exchanged. So we exchange segments of our DNA. Very critical for um, developing new organisms or excuse me, for developing new traits within the organism or within the lineage. Um, and like we've done before, the nuclear envelope starts to fragment in this prophase one stage. So let me just give you another visual of what crossing over is because it's so important. This is again is a bivalent or a tetrad and you see here you have the red, you have the green just like the holidays. Um, crossing over is when a little portion of one sister chromatid interchanges or mixes DNA from the other sister chromatid. So you end up with a organism that has um, DNA from the source with a little bit of DNA from the other chromosome and then the same on this side. So now when we're splitting our cells, you don't have two red lines or two green lines being split, um, but now you have chromosomes that are all red or red and green, and then some that are all green and then green and red. So again, that creates more genetic variability. So the next step in meiosis one is metaphase one. So again, very, very similar terminology. You're familiar with this. In metaphase one, um, those tetrads or bivalents are going to be organized along the middle of the cell, which is the metaphase plate. This will also have random arrangement of the sister chromatids. What does that mean? That means all the blues don't have to go on top. All the reds don't have to go on top. They can be flip-flop like it is here, where you have a red on top in this one and then a blue on top over there. That just means that's creating more variability in our new gametes. Anaphase, you're familiar with that. Our homologous pairs, our tetrads, our bivalents are all the same thing. They're going to split and go to the opposite side of the cell. So... <clears throat> Um, with our telophase, this is where those sister chromatids that have now split and go into the opposite side of the cell, they can start to decondense. That nuclear envelope will begin to form around them. And the final product is going to be two diploid genetically different cells. Um, so again, our final product are these diploid cells. So remember, we, we had a two N cell. We duplicated the DNA to make it a four N cell. And then in our first round of division, we still went back to a two uh, N cell. So the reason we went from two to four to two is so that we can actually exchange the DNA that occurs during the crossing over stage. We wanted to make sure we had an opportunity to do that and we needed to duplicate it so that we have that available. However, very important to notice that the DNA that we have here is going to be genetically different. That's because we had this crossing over that occurred that we did not have um, previously. So the DNA is genetically different. So again, we've, we've got to this point, we've got pretty far in the meiosis process so far, we're about halfway through. And here you can see that we started off with interphase, which is 2N. We duplicated, um, during the S phase of interphase, we duplicated our DNA to be 4N. And then as we went through meiosis one, we went through all the rounds, we had crossing over that occurs, we lined up, we split apart, we formed two nu nuclei, and then we ended meiosis one, you know, right around here in which we had two diploid genetically different cells. So now we're starting up prophase two, which is representative of meiosis two. So again, meiosis two is the second round of division. So now we're going from here to here. We need to finish off the rest of meiosis. Um, so again, this is where we just ended, right? You can see that um, diploid cell that has genetically different information. We go through prophase one, nuclear envelope dissolves, metaphase, they line up, anaphase, they pull apart, telophase, they form their own nuclei. We do not have crossing over that occurs here. We've already crossed over our DNA before. Um, it is this almost the same exact process as mitosis. Um, you know, we follow that process the whole way, but we do end up now with four haploid cells, okay? Because remember, we're doing this for each of our cells. So you have one, two, 
three, four. We split, this occurs with each of these cells that we made at the end of meiosis one. So meiosis two ends up with four haploid cells. Remember, they're still genetically different from the original diploid cells that we started this process with. This is just another way more detailed um, item if you want to look at this, if this kind of helps you to remember what's going on. Um, just a little bit about what happens in males and females. It's a little different as it relates to meiosis. Um, with our males, they undergo this entire process, meiosis one, and then they undergo meiosis two. Once they are done, one cell has actually split into four sperm. Um, so you have four viable sperm with DNA. Um, this is one of the reasons why men can produce a lot more sperm than women. Um, they're actually able to produce uh, a one to four ratio. So you start off with one cell and you can make four sperm that are ready to go and ready to fertilize an egg. Um, and this happens, of course, as puberty begins, men can continue to undergo this process up until 60, 70, 80. So it's, it's really no time limit for men. For females, it's much more different. When you're born, you actually have a certain number of undeveloped eggs that occur or that you have in your um, ovaries. And your eggs are kind of developed. They're there waiting and they stop. They, uh, I think after you're born, they stop right here. And once you start undergoing puberty each month, you're going to start to finish some of the process of meiosis too and release that egg in your ovulation as part of your menstrual cycle. But for females, one cell will only equal one egg. That's because we have uneven cytokinesis. Let's explain why. So this first original diploid cell that we start off with, it's called an oocyte. And as it does that first round of division, it normally would end in two separate cells that are even. But because the egg is the place that the um, embryo will grow in and all the nutrients and all of the mitochondria and other organelles we talked about will be in the egg, it has an uneven cytokinesis. So as it's splitting the internal components of the cell, it starts to kind of hog or take a lot more a lot more of the cellular parts in one of the eggs. This little thing called a polar body eventually dissolves in your body. You don't need it anymore. Um, so as you undergo the second round of meiosis, again, you have uneven cytokinesis. So you end up forming this big mega egg cell, which has genetic information, but also has a lot of organelles and nutrients and things that a, a baby would need as it's growing inside of the egg. So for females, one of our cells will only make one egg. So we don't have the same luxury as um, men do in which they can continue to make sperm over and over. We have basically a reservoir and after you're done with that, you're done. So students always find this a little bit interesting, especially since we're talking about eggs and sperms and um, that type of thing. I wanted to talk about twins. Um, so hopefully, normally I would have asked if anybody is a twin in the room. I would love to know if anybody's a twin because uh, this is a little back of a little bit of a throwback um, story for you. So twins that are identical, um, what happens is that once the egg is there ready to be fertilized and the sperm interacts with it, at some point very, very early in the division, right? So remember, the egg and the sperm are haploid, so they're one in. When they come together, they form a two in diploid organism. So normally, once that happens, you just start developing and multiplying, and then you become a little human being. But with an identical twins, very early in the process, that fertilized egg splits into two separate um organisms. And now those separate organisms will start to develop and grow and, and make, make brand new babies, right? So then you have identical twins. Those twins, they share the same placenta. They usually share the same um, amniotic sac, uh, all of that stuff. They are literally the same egg and sperm. They just split very, very early in the beginning, and then they started growing two separate humans. Twins actually have identical DNA. So if one twin, identical twin, committed a crime and you got DNA evidence, you could charge the other twin because the DNA is exactly the same. So that's what happens with identical twins. Fraternal twins, it's different. 
um, something occurs in the woman, whether it's natural or um, different types of um, medication, and they have two eggs that are present in the uterus, it interacts with two sperm. Um, so that's going to create two genetically different um, organisms, right? So it's going to be, you know, twin A, twin B. Um, they're going to have their own placentas. It's basically like two pregnancies at one time. Um, so this is where you have twins that are fraternal twins that are not identical, uh, but they were born at the same time just because they were fertilized at the same time in the, um, in the uterus. So that's essentially kind of a little bit of a story about uh, twins. Okay, so this is a really good document. I would have you um, just review and look through. Kind of is helping you to explain and understand the differences between mitosis and meiosis. So mitosis is regular cell division. Meiosis is where we're making those gametes. So ask yourself, where at in the body does mitosis or meiosis occur? What are the cell types it occurs for? What is the final ploidy? Is it haploid, diploid? Uh, what is the starting ploidy of these cells? What is the final number of cells and how many rounds of division do we have? So you should be able to answer those questions as you compare and contrast the two. Um, and this is another document from your textbook that really explains what's going on. Um, and it's a nice comparison between um, all three steps of mitosis, meiosis one and meiosis two. So really briefly, let's talk about chromosome structure and number of variation in these chromosome structures and numbers. Um, so as you change or as you vary the chromosome structure, um, this can have a really big effect on the organism. A lot of different um, human diseases can be affected by changing the, organ uh, the chromosome structure or number, um, but it has been useful for us sometimes as we evolved into new species. Now, once an organism is set, we typically don't like to have any type of changes to the chromosome number or structure, um, but bet between species, it is very common for them to be a different number of chromosomes or shapes. So humans have 46 chromosomes, but other organisms do not have 46 chromosomes, and that's fine because we're different. That's one of the reasons we're different. So let's look a little bit about these structural changes. I love this diagram because it's just very clearly talking about the different type of structural changes. So imagine the alphabet A through F. Um, some type of changes is if you have an inversion. So let's say um, it's supposed to, of course, be A, B, C, D, E, F. If you flip that C, D, E, you flip it, right? Normally A, B, C, D, E, F. You flip those three, that's an inversion. Duplication, two Ds here. Insertion, adding a totally another gene from somewhere else. Deletion, we're missing our C. And translocation, um, that's where you're kind of flipping the chromosomes from, from one pair to the next. So of course it's uppercase letters here, lowercase letters there. In our translocation, we've completely flipped these two sides of the chromosome. Again, this is just showing more of a realistic perspective, not a cartoon picture like I just showed you, but there are a lot of chromosomal mutations. Um, so when we look at a chromosome, there are a few things we can identify with this chromosome. Um, one is the size, um, the location of the centromere. The centromere is just the um, kind of the binding agent in the middle and then banding pattern. So you can kind of see it a little bit here where the dark lines versus light lines are that's known as banding pattern. So as we look at chromosomes, we can use any of these tools to identify them. So if you have a change in chromosome number, um, there are a few different terms that we can use to help us identify what the change is. So anytime you have something that's euploid, that means we have the normal number of chromosomes. So for us, we are diploid. That means we have two in, right? So that is very, very normal. Euploid means the normal number of chromosomes. That's great. Um, this is an example of a fruit fly, and it shows that it has four genes here, and all of them are diploid. Diploid is going to be two. Polyploid is where you have three or more sets of chromosomes. So it can either be a triploid or a tetraploid. Um, so in this fruit fly, you see it's a triploid. Instead of it being two like a diploid, it is three like a triploid. And then tetraploid, it is four. And then the final one is something called aneuploidy. That's where you have an abnormal number of just a particular chromosome. Um, so whether you're losing a chromosome or adding a chromosome, 
you can see that in aneuploidy. So here, this is naturally a diploid organism, but you have an additional chromosome on the second location here. And then on um, when we're losing a chrono chromosome, monosomy, you're lost a chromosome in chromosome position three. So anytime you're removing just a particular chromosome, that's aneuploidy. And this is a lot more common, um, especially in humans. So there's a special term here called non-disjunction. Non-disjunction is what happens when your chromosomes do not sort properly during cell division. So as we're taking our chromosomes, as we're lining them up in the middle, as we're pulling them apart, if something happens and you pulled too many chromosomes to one side or not enough chromosomes to the other side, you're going to start to get this non-disjunction. Um, so this is going to cause um, aneuploidy gametes. So as you're making those gametes, you're making that sperm, you're making that egg, that's going to cause gametes that either have too many chromosomes, like this one, it actually has uh, one too many, or it's going to have too few chromosomes, depending on how well we were able to split them in those early stages. So aneuploidy, right? That means we have a, too many or too few chromosomes in one of those particular um, positions. That's usually very lethal in animals. Um, there's a few animals that can survive, such as uh, bees, um, especially um, male bees. Um, but for the most part, that's going to be lethal. Um, there's actually about 5 to 10% of fertilized human eggs that result in um, an embryo lethality. So what that means is once your body recognizes um, in that very, very early stage of pregnancy, so it could be in a two weeks before uh, the woman would actually know she's pregnant, if your body can recognize that you actually have too many chromosomes or too few chromosomes, it will naturally um, abort that embryo naturally. So it's not anything that's medically induced, but it's just something that occurs in your body once it realizes that you have too many or too few chromosomes in the embryo. So there's some type of abnormality in the chromosome number. Um, so actually about 50% of all natural abortions um, that are due to um, that are in the very, very, very early stages of pregnancy. I'm not talking about um, something later on, more traumatic like miscarriages and those things, but in those very early days of a pregnancy, some of those can be due to alterations in chromosome number. Um, however, there are some abnormalities that can survive. So the body will recognize that it might have too many chromosomes, but it, it still allows the organism to develop and grow into you know, a normally functioning human. And those are where we have a trisomy, which is three chromosomes at chromosome position 13, 18, or 21. And also any, any of the chromosomes in the sex chromosome, which are the very last chromosomes we have. So again, a little bit of a guide for you. If um, probably the most common genetic abnormality where you have too many chromosomes is Down syndrome. And Down syndrome is where you have three chromosomes at position 21. Um, and there, these are some of the characteristics of Down syndrome. Um, also Edwards syndrome and Patel syndrome at chromosomes 18 and 13. Um, and then also if you have um, the incorrect number of sex chromosomes, this can also lead to some challenges as well. So normally if females are XX and males are XY, um, but there are a number of different disorders that can occur if you have either too many uh, chromosomes or too few in Turner syndrome uh, chromosomes as well. And the final closing thought is it relates to non-disjunction. Remember, this is how your cells are able to split the chromosomes, is that um, studies have shown as women age, right, as they starting to reach um, past 35, 40s, 45 and up, um, the number of um, genetic abnormalities associated with the pregnancy are starting to rise. So as you age past a certain age, you have higher chances. Now, again, this is still very low on this graph. This is per 1,000 births. You're going from 10 to 30, which is still very minimal. But st uh, regardless, your body is not as able to split apart that 
cell and and be able to identify and put the chromosomes in the correct correct location as you age. Um, so that's why as women age, as they get beyond 35, um, pregnancy can have a lot more challenges because there are usually a uh, there can be some genetic. Um, associations due to that age and the non disjunction that occurs. So that's just something to kind of help um, you kind of uh, understand what's happening maybe around you or things you may have heard in uh, pop culture or in life. So we are done with um, this portion of the lecture. Please rewind it. Please look through it. If you have any questions, save them and we will discuss them in class. Thank you.